So perhaps for a confer conference on farming, a strange slide to start with may be a picture of a boat. But that's where my journey to this room began and my journey to understanding the principles of the circular economy. You may or may not be aware that my history was racing. My goal from the age of four was to sail around the world. Somehow, I wanted to sail around the world. I had no idea how I would achieve that, but that was absolutely my goal. And I was lucky enough to do that twice solo, once in a race in 2000 called the Vendée Globe, and this time was the second time in 2004 to try to be the fastest person ever to sail solo nonstop around the world. And I'm the last person who ever thought I would be standing here talking about economics and farming. But it was, quite, it was quite an interesting insight for me into how systems function. When you set off on one of these boats around the world, you enter a different space. You enter a different mindset. You behave in a different way. You're incredibly stressed, you're full of adrenaline, and you're managing this tiny world, which is your cocoon, that keeps you alive. Now, these boats are pretty exciting. It's not a gentle sail in the sunshine waving at people on the beaches. You generally don't see land when you sail around the world. They go wrong very quickly. And I know this very well because I was one of the five crew members on this boat and that boat flipped upside down literally in five seconds. Now that could happen at any time when you're sailing around the world. And that could happen when you're in the Southern Ocean two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest town. If that happens, you probably won't make it, and if help can get to you, it takes five days, and then five days for that ship to get you back into a hospital. So you really are isolated, and you really do understand that what you have with you on that boat is all you have, there is no more. And it was that understanding that I developed from sailing, that, that, that fundamental understanding of what finite truly means, that on that boat what you have is all you have. There are no more resources. You're two and a half thousand miles to the nearest shop. That led me to look at the economy in a different way. You live in a different world. You perceive what's around you in a different way. And I couldn't get that out of my head when I finished that record. I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was like a tiny little spark under a rock. And you know, a large part of me wanted to put that rock back down and carry on with my dream job of racing around the world. But I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I had to put that rock to one side and learn more about resources, energy. How does the economy function? You know, we too have finite resources available to us once in the history of humanity. So I started to learn. I started to study. I went to a coal-fired power station. This must be now eight years ago. And coal is probably lighting the, you know, this room here today. It's incredibly important still in the United Kingdom for energy generation. And it was a subject very close to my family because my great-grandfather was a coal miner. It's a photo of him, quite an old photo as you can see because nobody has trousers quite that high in this day and age. <laughs> Though you never know, they may come back. Um, but actually it's, it's not that old because this is me with my great grandfather. And we were really close. He used to tell me his mining stories from when he worked deep under mine, underground. The fact they worked with ponies to pull the coal out from the coal face. He was alive until I was 11 years old. This is really not that long ago. And yet when I went on this journey of learning to try and understand the resources that we have available to us, thinking it would all be okay, one of the places I went to was the World Coal Association. And there in the middle of the homepage it said, we're not about to run out of coal, we've got about 118 years left. And I did the maths and I realized that my great-grandfather had been born exactly 118 years before that year. And you realize it's nothing. It's time in time, nothing in history. And it made me make the decision I never, ever thought I would make, which was to completely leave the sport of solo sailing and focus on global economics to understand what success can look like for us, for the global economy, for farming, for children, for us, for everything. Because the way the economy functions at the moment uses these materials up, as I did on my boat, but we cannot restock at the end of that journey. And, you know, you realize it's, it's not just the energy, the coal, of course, it's the materials. New Scientist 2008, how many years left? Those graphs are too small to read, but you know, we're talking about you know, even 59 years of uranium, 13 years of indium in every LCD screen. You know, these, we don't know these figures exactly, but what we do know is these materials are finite. We have them once, 
and we're using them up at a faster and faster rate. And one thing we do know is that line cannot go vertical because it's based on a supply of finite resources exactly as the prince said. We take them in in a consumptive manner, we extract them, we consume them, and we're using them up. Is there a different way of doing things? And you can define that, if you like, as a linear economy, an economy that takes some material out of the ground, makes something out of it, and then ultimately the majority of that product gets thrown away. We're able to recover some of the material, but by defi definition, it is a conveyor belt, exactly as he described the transition of farming from being restorative and regenerative, even just 100 years ago, to now run on the extractive and consumptive principles of a linear economy. And that's worked quite well for a while, but now we have a growing population, we have more and more pressure on resources, and we know the inputs are finite. So as a long-term plan, it simply cannot work. Linear cannot function in the long term. And as I went on my own journey trying to understand what success could look like, what fascinated me were other ideas. Was the fact that life itself, which has existed for billions of years, has always been restorative and regenerative. 3.8 billion years of research proven to work, and in just a few hundred years, in fact, since the Industrial Revolution, we have completely changed that. So taking ideas such as cradle-to-cradle -cradle design, industrial symbiosis, looking at life itself, looking at uh, everything from biomimicry to the performance economy to the sharing economy, looking at different ideas that exist within the economy, is there a way we could shift that line so that line becomes circular? So when we approach anything that we do within our economy, we do that in a circular way. We look at life itself, the fact that life itself has never had waste, has restored and regenerated, and has had its own guiding principles. And what if you apply that to the global economy? So not just the, the materials such as you know, the biodegradable materials, human waste, farm waste, agricultural waste, food production waste, not just those materials that cycle, as they have arguably for billions of years, but also technical materials, stuff that really will never biodegrade. Metals, plastics, polymers. What if they too were designed to fit within a cycle? At the beginning, at the design stage, when anything was designed, we will design this product so we can recover the materials. And better still, we will design this product so it's remanufacturable, so we can collect the materials, so that we can keep them at their highest value, you know, as this clicker, rather than the bits of plastic and metal within it. This has more value than what's within it. The components within it have more value than the materials within it. So actually, the last loop is recycling. If we can keep it at higher value with the inner loops, then we can continue to use those resources at a much higher value for longer, knowing at the end of that cycle, they will feed back into the economy, technical or biological. And if that could run on renewable energy, and what we've seen through the statistics around remanufacturing are that you can reduce energy demand by 80%. If you remanufacture something rather than melt it down and start from scratch, 80% less materials, 80% less energy. So the questions you ask when it comes to renewable energy are very, very, sorry, very, very different. When we created the Ellen MacArthur Foundation seven years ago, our goal was to accelerate the transition to this circular economy, working with young people, which is absolutely vital. So they see the world from the beginning in a circular way, but also working with businesses who know the linear system can't run in the long term. Working on analysis and insight, looking at the numbers, what does this circular economy mean to the global economy? Does it make more money or is it expensive? Hoping that it would make more money. And every single report we've done to date, which is about nine now, has shown there is economic rationale for shifting from linear to circular. It makes more money. So the most hard-nosed businessmen, they, they get this because if they can become circular, they will unlock more value for their company. And we believe that's the most important driver so far of the circular economy, because although we know the idea makes common sense, if there is economic value to be had, employment to be had, growth for countries to be had, through decoupling growth from these resource constraints we have, then it will happen much more quickly. When it comes to the harmony principles, as I mentioned earlier, I won't go over that again, there's, there's great crossover because Harmony is about everything being connected. Harmony is about strength and diversity. That's absolutely what we talk about within a circular economy. Many different companies, many different sizes, many different cities, many different sizes. There is diversity. There is strength in that diversity. And we should embrace that and understand that. And the fact that nature itself depends on cycles, well, that is at the heart of the circular economy. 
So a few examples, you know, we draw this diagram as a, an illustration of what a circular economy could look like. On the left, we have anything biodegradable. So that would ideally re-enter food and farming, or industrial systems, if it's a piece of timber that turns from this lectern into chipboard and then into particle board, and then maybe at the end of the life of that particle board, if it's designed correctly, it could be biodigested and turned into fertilizer, heat and energy. How many times can you use that resource before it gets to the end of its period of use, before it re-enters the biological cycle? You could just burn it, or you could make a lectern, chipboard, particle board, and then energy, heat, and light at the end, and fertilizer, obviously. So the, the left-hand side is anything biodegradable. That could be a cotton T-shirt, this lectern, agricultural waste, farming waste, food production waste, us ourselves, everything physically that biodegrades. And then the right-hand side of the diagram we call the technical materials, metals, plastics, polymers, but looked at through that same lens of circularity, saying what if that were designed so that we could keep them at their highest value at all times, be it a car or a plane or a chair or a, a, a phone, but design it so that at the end of its use period, it comes back in and the materials can be recovered. And then you've built a restorative, regenerative system. And particularly in the area of food and farming, you've built a system that actually restores and regenerates the land. It doesn't slow down the demise, as we hear talked about so often, but it actually rebuilds natural capital faster and faster. And when we work with young people, they get this immediately. They want to build a better system, better than ours. It's incredibly inspiring. Renault with remanufacturing, I mentioned, 80% less, en less energy and less materials. There's a couple of technical examples. But it's not just how you remanufacture and save energy, it's the system that enables that to come back. Even Apple now has a tariff in the US where you get a new phone every year. You would think, well, you know, what's circular about that? The moment you go on this tariff, they own the phone. So at the end of the year, they get the phone back. They know everything that's in that phone. We have no idea. They know what to do with it. They may resell it, they may remanufacture it, or they may recover the materials and put them in the next phone. But that phone no longer stays in our drawer at home when we don't know what to do with it. It feeds back into a system, and that could exist for lighting being provided as a service anything that exists which is technical within the global economy. And then there's that left side, the biological material, food, sorry, food waste. In every tonne of food waste, there's $8 of fertilizer, sorry, $6 of fertilizer, $18 of heat, and $28 of electricity in every single tonne. And how much of that is fed back into that system from our cities, from our towns, even perhaps from our villages? You know, this is a massive resource, not just food waste, but human waste agricultural waste. In fact, we did a study looking at the numbers saying if we could collect all this together globally, could we actually replace current chemical fertilizer use? Actually thinking the answer was probably going to be no. The answer was yes by 2.7 times. Now we're a long way from that, but it shows the potential of looking at the materials we have available to us in a regenerative and restorative way. You look at the aggregate nutrients from cities, this is Paris, Peaked in 1900, 40% of nitrogen was recovered. Now it's barely 5%. There's such potential there to get this material back to farms and to rebuild natural capital, to restore the health of the soil. We've broken that system that existed for so long. It's time to reconnect it and really, truly understand the economic case for that. Because so far, all our studied into circular economy have shown there is very, very strong economic rationale to shift from linear to circular. There's more money to be had in the circular system. And it's not all about money, but money is a great driver in today's economy. Also, these materials sitting in a landfill site, if these were designed correctly, none of this would be waste. Anything biological would re-enter the biocycle, and anything technical would be recovered and regenerated if it were correctly designed to feed back into that technical cycle. We lose between 90 and 120 billion US dollars worth of plastic as a material by value every single year because we don't design it or the systems to recover it so that it can be valorized. And then different ideas for packaging that don't mean that they have to be made of, of plastic. This packaging is made by a company in the US. It's actually mycelium, mold, and corn husks. They are now producing this on price parity with styrofoam, which is what it's designed to replace. That will never become waste. Even that ends up in the, if it ends up in the ocean or under a hedge in a field, it has value because it's designed to enter the biocycle. It's a different way of looking at things. We are also quite capable of producing plastics in this way as well.
And then fabrics. This company based in Switzerland, they make fabrics that you could actually eat if you wanted because they went through about 350 inks that they used or dyes for their fabric. They went through the materials that they used for their fabric and they chose the selection that were non-toxic, that were biodegradable. Not only could you eat it if you wanted, but they're put in aeroplanes, so the air quality is better because they're not full of toxins. The waste material is used for farms, not only to cover the crops to help the crops to grow more quickly, but also they re-enter the soil as a nutrient. They feed the system that they're designed for. And these economic reports that I mentioned are absolutely vital in our understanding of a circular economy, to try and truly understand the numbers, to try and understand if we look through that prism or that lens in a way that harmony approaches, in a way that the circular economy approaches, looking at the entire system, what would be the benefits? And I'll just finish with one report we produced for Europe. And we were looking at cities as great aggregators of nutrients. But we were looking at how you could become more circular from a built environment perspective, from a mobility perspective, and also from a food systems perspective. And to the point that the Prince made, how do you use the digital revolution to help that rather than it set off exciting things in lots of directions that don't help us to achieve a world which can run in the long term. And we found those figures to be absolutely fascinating. If you harness that digital revolution in Europe within those three sectors, 32, by 2030, you save 32% of primary material use, and by 2050, 53% of primary material use. CO2 reduction, 2030, 48%, and by 2050, 83%. CO2 reduction, and you see an 80% decrease in chemical fertilizer use by 2050, which all, it is a few years in the future, but 80% is a massive slice of what we currently use today. So we found it hugely um, energizing as a foundation, and that was launched at the European Commission when they opened the public consultation on the circular economy package, which is now fully up and running, and they're writing legislation to try and make this happen at the moment. So we really do see significant momentum with cities and regions, with companies, we have companies all over the world embracing this and understanding how they become circular, with an education with universities all over the world, where we have lecturers, mentors within the university, understanding the teaching and learning around circular economy, but also the research that has to happen to understand it in more detail. And cities is the theme that I'd like to finish on because you know, cities you would think of as a long way from farming, but they are aggregators of nutrients. They're great aggregators of technical materials, such as you know, metals and plastics, but also biological material. And for the circular economy ses session this afternoon, to focus on how cities can be transformative agents to help food and farming systems, I think is a very relevant question. This is happening. More and more people live in cities today. Food comes in from the countryside, comes in from food production into cities. Some good food, some food produced in a marginal way, perhaps. But how do you get that nutrient to be something of great value and feed it back into that food and farming system as has existed for billions of years? And just finally, you know, is this possible? Well, to shift the entire global economy from linear to circular is quite a big, it's quite a big call and it's quite a big task. But if you look what can happen in a lifetime, you realize that anything really is possible. When my great-grandfather was born in 1894, there were 25 cars on the road in the entire world. 25, that's it. When he was four, uh, sorry, when he was 13 years old, we built the first aeroplane. Now three times the population of the world fly every single year. Three times the population of the world back then fly every single year. When he was 40, we built the first computer and many said it wouldn't catch on, but we turned that into a microchip within just 20 years. 10 years before he died, the mobile phone arrived. It definitely wasn't a smartphone of today but it changed infrastructure across the entire world in emerging markets. It showed there was a different way of developing, and we believe the circular economy is a different model, sorry, model of development for emerging markets. And as my great-grandfather left this earth, the internet arrived. If ever there is a time we can change the global economy, it's right now. We can share an idea from Wales to the rest of the world in seconds. Thank you.